so I have um, two countries that I call my home country. One is that blue flag, Guatemala, uh, which is a fantastically beautiful country. But for most of my adolescence, it was, um, it was a country in war. It was in a civil war, long civil war, and uh, things were very hard to come by. So I could say with confidence that I grew up in a place of scarcity. The other country is a country that my parents came from, that wasn't born, uh, where the story was completely different. Uh, Japan in the 80s was in its economic boom. Right? All the co uh, companies that, Japanese companies that you know today, the Sony, the Toshiba's, the Kyotech, and all, all of those companies um, were changing not only the face of consumerism, but the very way your living room looked like. So as a kid living in that blue country, that other country was a place of amazement. And because I didn't get to travel to that other country very often, it sort of became over time a place of, that I was obsessed with. And so you can imagine that one of those days, one, one of those days when uh, a guest from Japan came to my house, it was a TV game like this, which is a, a Nintendo game, uh, and how ecstatic, ecstatic we were to receive this game. But the problem was that we didn't own a TV game console. So we didn't get to play the game. So stand in my shoes, 12, 12 years old, and you get this game from Japan and you're really, really happy, but you can't play it. What do you do? Right? Do you try to hack a way to play it? Do you perhaps wrap it around aluminum foil and try to stick it in the DCR to see that some kind of magnetic the old mojo would give you a glance of what it is on the TV screen. Would you put it on under your pillow to see if you could dream the game? Right? Of course, I did all those things and I failed on all those things. You guys all know because you are very intelligent. But, um, but every time I would fail on these pursuits, I would look at the game cartridge and I would fantasize and imagine what the game was about. Essentially, that's where my creativity stems from. It is between that place of idealism and obsession towards that idealism and that place of scarcity. It's that middle ground. And I have made it my lifetime mission to fill that gap with my imagination and my creativity. And I feel lucky that I work in a company that sort of does the same thing. My company um, has a very high um, idealism of what the future should be, what society should be, and they're filling the white spaces with the ideas and technology and hard work. But when you are at the very cusp, at the very edge of innovation, you're bound to fail many times. And the most important thing when you're in that mode is the size of your inventory, the size of your inventory of ideas. I call it the size of your uh, Lego box. And since you cannot create anything significant with one Lego piece, the reason is that you should have many, many, many Lego pieces, right? And the way to collect many, many um, Lego pieces, in my opinion, is to look around the world because I'm a firm believer of um, first-hand data, or primary uh, data, as they call it. And observing the world and ex and extracting uh, ideas and concepts the, from the world is something apparently that we don't do very well, according to my friend, Sherlock Holmes. There is a sort of a small story, a scene in one of the books, and I'm gonna massively paraphrase because I don't know, I, I, you know, I cannot remember the whole story, but where Watson basically asks uh, Holmes, what is the difference between them two? One of them is a well-renowned detective, and the other one is sort of a layman like us. And uh, Sherlock sort of, in a long form, tells him basically that one of them only sees the world, where the other one sees and observes the world. And that's the difference. And that's also the difference that makes on us um, looking at the world. And, and to test that, I would like to see how much of a detective you are uh, with this video from TFL. <laughs> Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts 
at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So as you can see, we think we're seeing the world, but actually we're missing most of it, right? I came across this sort of scientific data when I was doing research for this, that at any given time we're exposed to about 11 million data points, and that we only process about 40 of them. It's quite amazing. So, once you, because you know this data now, are you paying more attention to who's sitting next to you? Are you paying more attention to me? And in order to prove this point, you know, because I'm a person that believes in primary data, I have walked around stage for the entire day with my flies up. And none of you, none of, none of anybody has really noticed. Maybe it is out of, oh, somebody did. Oh, a couple of people did. <laughs> you guys are doing really well. You guys are very, very observant. So you guys are very good. But I'm just going to close this because it's going to be distracting. <laughs> All right, so back to the, back to the talk. <laughs> we are here faced with a conundrum, a dilemma. On one hand, we have Sherlock Holmes who tells us the seeing, observing the world is something that we should do tomorrow. And on the other hand, we have this brain that filters everything except the vital things that we should be looking at, right? How do we reconcile these two ideas? How do we move beyond that bottleneck of that brain in order to observe the world more? And this is why I came here to tell you. And the point is to fall in love. Right? It's to fall in love with the subject that you're trying to observe because apparently when you fall in love, there are all these chemicals that are released in your head, oxytocin, uh, other tongue twister kind of uh, hormones that in conjunction makes you look at the subject even more harder. And this is no, uh, you know, you don't have to use science to prove this because you know, you're falling in love with somebody and you want to see that person more and you spend more time with, with that subject, with that subject more and then you want to study more. But once you start seeing the things more, something remarkable happens your prejudice, your preconceived notions, and your ways of thinking that what that thing should be sort of goes out of the window, right? You break that barrier, mental barrier of indifference, and you, first, for the first time, can start seeing the thing from what it is. And one thing that you should do here is to start looking at the properties and the mechanisms of the object, right? How it works, what is it composed of? And only by doing so, you can subtract or extract uh, elements from life and make it your Lego pieces. Let me take you through an example from my home. Uh, when, when my wife and I travel, uh, we make a point to collect shower caps, right, from, from the hotels that we go. And this is because my wife is super intelligent and she knows that this is more than a shower cap. She knows the different properties that the shower cap has. And she uses those properties and applies it to everyday life. For example, she puts it on a bread dough to cover it from the dust falling in, and also for the moisture from evaporating. She puts it on the uh, bicycle uh, paddle when it, after raining, right? You can probably use those, a lot of those in Cambridge and Oxford. 
And because this, the size of the power cap is almost perfect, it puts shoes in, it puts shoes in when you travel so that it doesn't soil the rest of your clothes in your suitcase. And the more you look into the world and more you can extract these principles and ideas, the more you can apply them to real life, the more you can combine them and make more different ideas. The truth is that our life is a sequence of experiences. And if we don't fall in love with life itself, I'm afraid that we might end up missing a lot of it. And I would like to close with a, a quote from one of my favorite books, History Boys, by one of our neighbors in Francis Town called Alan Barnett. And the quote reads, the best moments in reading are when you come across something feeling, a way of looking at things, which you had thought special and particular to you. Now here it is, set down by somebody else, a person you have never met, even someone even you, who has been long dead. And it is as if a hand has come out and has taken yours. So when I think about the, the place of my obsession, that place of idealism, in the white space that I have to fill to get there, I think about this hand. But this hand for me doesn't reach out from the past. It reaches out from the future. And I would like you to invite you to reach out to that hand to fill that white space in front of us with our own imagination, own creativity, and own curiosity. Thank you very much.